Good morning. morning. Welcome to Christ Lutheran Church. My name is Pastor Lynn Weedman. We welcome those who are here today and those who are also watching us online. We thank God for the privilege of being able to proclaim his gospel both in person and electronically. The Lord has opened such doors for us to get the word out about Jesus. The question that I would like you to think about this morning is why did Jesus really come? What was the purpose of it? My first thought is he came to die. But there's more to the story. And uh, the Gospel of Mark will help us to think about that why did he bother to come? And of course, we'll pay attention to his own words about that. This uh, particular church year focuses our attention on the Gospel of Mark. And so, if you don't mind, why don't you think about joining me as I work through the Gospel of Mark as I preach and in my own personal meditations. Likely the eyewitness account of Peter, uh, recorded by the Gospel writer Mark, who was, uh, well, disqualified by Paul for messing up and uh, reinstated and then becomes a very useful partner in Gospel ministry. Uh, Part of what you'll notice when you read the Gospel of Mark is that when Peter is around, there's incredible detail that's put into the text, detail that would be obvious to somebody who was really there. The order of service begins with our opening hymn, Lord Jesus Christ, you have prepared, verses 1 and 4, a communion hymn as we begin our service. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and to worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please stand? Uh, before we continue, I uh, just want to make sure that everybody has the elements for Holy Communion as we continue. If you don't, we'll ask the ushers to kind of uh, help out. Everybody prepared? Thank you. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So if you want to go ahead and open the, the little baggie and the part of the little chalice that has the wafer in it, take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. And then uh, open the wine portion, take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. May his body and blood strengthen and preserve you in the true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace and joy. Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, you are the one who possesses all authority in heaven and on earth. You command the demons to be silent and to leave. You heal the sick and raise the dead. But above all else, you give to us your body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. They are your words which empower this sacrament because you have all authority. Bless this congregation with your power and your peace. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue on page four with our next hymn, Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness, Thinking About Jesus' Authority. Him 353.
Scripture lessons are printed for you on pages 5 and following in the worship folder. Our Old Testament lesson is from the book of Job, chapter 7, verses 1 to 7. Do not mortals have hard service on earth? Are not their days like those of hired laborers? Like a slave longing for the evening shadows or a hired laborer waiting to be paid? So I have been allotted months of futility and nights of misery have been assigned to me. When I lie down, I think, how long before I get up? The night drags on and I toss and turn until dawn. My body is clothed with worms and scabs. My skin is broken and festering. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, and they come to an end without hope. Remember, O God, that my life is but a breath. My eyes will never see happiness again. This is the word of the Lord. Tough to read pages, words like that in our Bibles. But... If you've lived a few minutes in this world, you know that these words accurately reflect the pain and suffering. And our God wants us to think about what he sees with his eyes of compassion when he views the sick and suffering in this world. The second lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll read verses 16 to 23. The sad truth about the church in Corinth was that they despised Paul's ministry. And there were people there who were relentless in their attacks. Chapter 9 focuses our attention on that ministry. For when I preach the, bo bo when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I am compelled or propelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I, make, I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. This is the word of the Lord. We continue with the sermon hymn for today, Hail to the Lord's Anointed. It's hymn number 93.
please stand for the gospel. The Holy Gospel and our sermon text for today are from the Gospel of St. Mark in chapter 1, verses 29 to 39. As soon as Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else, to the nearby towns, it's really like market towns, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. This is God's word. Please be seated. My dear friends, in Christ Jesus, our Savior. So why did Jesus come? If you were back in the day of Jesus and asked somebody what the work and role of the Messiah was, you would get a whole raft of answers, almost none of them correct. And it's interesting that the answers given 2,000 years ago are answers that we still hear today without actually much change at all. And again, still mostly completely incorrect. So when we ask the question, why did Jesus come? What do we hear? Jesus' critics said that he was actually an agent of Satan, like a fifth columnist or a spy who snuck in among the religious people who pretended to be against Satan, but was really working for him. Others have said that Jesus and Christianity are like opium. The people who have power use Christianity and the message of Jesus to feed something to the have-nots of the world so that they can maintain control over them. Religion is used as a weapon, then, in the economic battles of our world. Jesus is a political force. The Jews of his day hoped, at least some of them hoped, that Jesus would drive out the Romans and establish some kind of political kingdom. And, of course, they would be first and second in that kingdom. And it's interesting to watch over the ages as emperors have used religion and the, to bring people together under their authority. Adolf Hitler was doing that, and so did Constantine. And is it possible that both the right and the left are claiming these days that Jesus is on their side and they're doing Jesus' work? And yet the work that they propose is almost completely opposite. And you wonder what Jesus would think. But did he come for that? Some people point to verses like the ones we're looking at and say the real purpose of, of Jesus' Christianity is the role of compassion and mercy. Our job is to feed the hungry and take care of the sick and the dying. Which, of course, Jesus does. But is there more to it than that? Others hope that Jesus would finally clean up the church, get things back to the way they were supposed to be, where the church was actually godly. But they differed significantly what that actually meant. But when you ask Jesus, 
he says, let's go somewhere else to the nearby city markets where I, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. The city of Capernaum was the place that Jesus now called home. And they've actually found a synagogue there that they think might have been the one that Jesus was at. And when he came to preach there in the verses of just before our text, it's mentioned that when he preached, the people said, this is somebody who preaches with authority. Not like the Jews before them and the people of God. We actually have books that were written and collected from the time of Jesus' work. And the rabbis would collect all the opinions of all of the scholars and learned people. Rabbi so-and-so says this and that. Rabbi such-and-such such says so-and-so. But when you put the things together, the rabbi said exactly opposite things. And you could pick one or you could pick the other, but when you say which one is right, who knows? When Jesus preached, oh, that's such a bad word today. I remember accidentally that my daughters said, don't preach to us. I don't think they thought preaching was a good thing. So what is preaching today? Is it hot air dispensed for the few that bother to come? And when I preach, do you regard my words as authoritative? Things that you must do and obey and believe without doubt and without question? If we want to hear it all, we maybe switch from channel to channel until we find something we like to hear. We pick out the things that we think are good and toss out all the things that we don't like very much. And so the word preaching today doesn't really have that word authority Put in it. The word that Mark uses is really much more like the idea of the representative of the king saying to people, this is how it's going to be. So much more like an announcement or a proclamation backed up by the clout and authority of the one who sent him. And the people caught that authority. They understood that when Jesus talked, he was talking about the way things are going to be. He didn't say, well, what do you think about this? He didn't say, well, you can do this or you can do that and offer contradictory ideas. Jesus said, this is how it's going to be. And that's how it was. He preached as one who had authority. And Mark underlines that idea by giving us an example of how it worked. In the synagogue at Capernaum, there was a person who was possessed by a demon. This is one of the fallen angels who works under the authority of Satan. And Jesus said to the demon, come out and be quiet. The demon has to comply. He has no say in the matter whatsoever. And when he tries to say something about Jesus, Jesus silences him so that he can't say anything at all. That's authority. Authority over the demons themselves. This absolute authority is not something that the disciples missed. So if you have somebody who possesses all authority and he's your friend and you go home and your mother-in-law is burning up with a fever, is it really surprising that Jesus would go to, that Peter would go to Jesus and say, my mom's sick? And do you see the authority that Mark wants you to see as Jesus reaches out his hand and lifts her up? And do you see how she responds to his authority? She immediately serves him. 
And I'm thinking that, that Peter, as he tells Mark about this, is kind of putting in his plug for his mother-in-law and his wife. Because they actually cared about Jesus and his authority. I, that kind of authority and that kind of power doesn't go unnoticed. So it's not a surprise at all that by the time it gets dark, so when you get close to the equator, the sun goes down and you've got about 30 minutes of twilight and then it's pitch black. So when it got dark, everybody would be done working and they started bringing all of these people from the city of Capernaum to the front door of Peter's house. And there were people who had all kinds of different medical problems. There were also people who were demon-possessed. Mark helps us to realize that they could tell the difference. So they weren't like people later on who said that everything physical was caused by the devil, nor are they like people today who say that nothing physical was ever caused by the devil. They knew the difference, and they knew that they needed somebody who had authority. And so we find Jesus carefully and compassionately dealing with the man that's demon-possessed, with his mother-in-law. And then all of a sudden, it's like it, he turns the coin over to the other side, and he's dealing with absolutely everybody from the entire city of Capernaum. Big crowds. And this is kind of a key to understanding the question, why did Jesus come? It helps us understand why he left Capernaum. Jesus has this incredible ability to pay attention to every single one. And at the same time, think about the entire world without losing track of any one. And so when we think about the ministry of Jesus, we want to keep in mind this careful balancing that he does between the one and the many. It's not like the good of the many outweighs the needs of the one, nor do the needs of the one outweigh the good of the many. It's both. And so when churches say, we got to take care of our own first, the word first is the only wrong word in that sentence. But it's really wrong. We have to take care of each one. The good shepherd goes out looking for that one lost sheep. And on the other hand, it's wrong for people to despise the church that pays attention to the one as if the world is more important. It's not more important. It's equally important. And so the mission of the church, like the mission of the Savior, has to be the mission of the one and the many. Because our Lord Jesus Christ shows compassion to all people. There's a special feature that we see here in the Gospel of Mark that connects the physical diseases and the spiritual ones. We know that before the fall into sin, there was neither sickness nor death. And after the fall into sin, there's frustration and conflict and sickness and death and hell. And so when we think about the cause, the root cause of all physical difficulties and physical problems and physical death, it's sin, a spiritual condition. When you think about America today, do people talk much about demons? Does our Christian education system really prepare our children to go to war against the lion that's prowling about seeking those whom he may devour? Do we really believe that we are at war not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers and authorities in the heavenly realms, demons and Satan himself? 
Do we know that Satan desires to sift us like wheat? And that Jesus is praying that our faith does not fail? It seems like we in America struggle with this understanding about the spiritual sicknesses that we face. In other parts of the world, every physical disease or problem, economic difficulty, is ascribed to some kind of demon or god. And there is no physical left. It's all about these demons and gods and the way they try to cure people is with worship. We sometimes see that kind of nonsense floating around in America too, but not as often as there. So which is it? We find, thank God, that our Lord and Savior is actually concerned about both. And he understands the need and the connection between both of them. The truth is that Christians particularly struggle when they are sick and suffering. And they do so not because, I mean, we're like everybody else when we get sick, right? My severe cold is no different than the severe cold of the atheist. But when I have a severe cold, my God tells me to rejoice in sufferings. This is a lot harder to do than simply take a cold tablet and be done with it. God places, and we hear it in Job, God places on believers a special responsibility that makes their lives much more difficult in times of suffering. It's a spiritual challenge. And God in his grace and mercy is making sure that we have the kind of protection from these spiritual problems that no 95 mask will ever provide. But on the other hand, where do those masks come from? And who knows the size of the viruses? Our God does, who controls all things for our good, including the virus. And so our Lord Jesus comes. But why does he leave Capernaum? Peter had no clue. Here was a place where Jesus was well accepted and popular, not like Nazareth. They tried to push him off a cliff there. He was welcomed. He, was, he had a great reputation. Everybody was at the door from the whole town. Just imagine what that would be like if all of Eden Prairie was out at our front door this morning. Socially distanced, of course. But think about that challenge. And Jesus gets up before it gets light out, goes off to a mountain and prays, and when he gets done with his conversation with the Father, the divine plan is, I'm leaving. If his mission was to provide for the sick and suffering, he shouldn't have left. If his goal was to gather a large group of people around himself, he shouldn't have left. So why did he leave? Jesus says, let us go somewhere else to the nearby market towns so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. There's something, and we really saw it in the verses before our text. Jesus has a message that he wants to deliver, a message that possesses all authority and power. The kingdom of God is near. And that kingdom of God comes to each one of you because he brings to you a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. When I baptized James this morning in our private service after, what will I give him? I will give him the Holy Spirit. Actually, God does the work. And the forgiveness of sins. That's what Jesus was preaching about. This gospel that we have and treasure is given to us to comfort God's people. There's power and authority there. This Jesus is the one who dies to take away eternal death from us. To destroy the power of the devil by his own death. And he rises again to remind us that he has the power to raise the dead and give to the believers in Christ 
eternal life. That's authority. That's power. And that authority and that power is compassionately delivered to every single person in the world by the Savior who controls all things, physical and spiritual, for your good. I have come to preach, Jesus says. And the gospel he preaches is our great treasure. Amen. Would you please stand? On page 7 in the worship folder, you'll find the words of the Nicene Creed. Please join me. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Join me, please, in the responsive prayer of the church. And as we do, we'd like to remember in our prayers James Andre Wilkins, Williamson, who will be baptized in a private service this morning, God willing. Uh, we'd like to thank God for the successful surgery at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia uh, to repair baby William Benz's cleft lip. And then we'd also like to remember in our prayers Dorothy Sparvey, that's Eileen's mom. She's 85 and is suffering a recurrence of cancer that is now spreading. She is very ready for the Lord to take her to glory. Pray for joy, comfort, and trust in God's plan. I'd like to remember Pastor Schultz in our prayers for his ministry. He has returned the call to Christ Lutheran and will continue serving in the La Crosse area. I'd like to remember our congregation as we plan for our next a congregational meeting to call our pastor, and the Lord's richest blessings for all of you as you listen carefully to those powerful words of Jesus. Join me in the responsive prayer. It's printed on page 8. Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand, the beauties of creation and the bounties of the earth, the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your son's body and blood, which you give us to eat and to drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you have sent your Holy Spirit into our hearts and united us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Strengthen us through this heavenly food we have received. Increase our trust in Christ and our love for one another. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you have given us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, 
the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. Move us to pray for those in need and to help them with deeds of kindness. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with our closing hymn, The King of Glory Comes, hymn number 363. 